Okay, guys, welcome to uh, our first edition of Seeing My Face on this screen. Um, hopefully this works for our flipped classroom. I'm really trying to put some stuff together that's interesting for you. So rather than you hearing me talk about Ming China and how it began, I'm going to let you listen to a professor of Chinese history talk about it in one of his podcasts. I edited it down so there are a lot fewer things that you really have to know, and I've put some stuff on the screen for you. So hopefully you enjoy, and say bye-bye to the Mongols. Right at the tail end of the Yuan Dynasty, you had this potent cocktail of popular uprisings everywhere. Natural disasters, you had secret societies springing up like the White Lotus and the Red Turbans. The 1350s were like all those other times in China when one dynasty was on its way out and another one was starting to form. You had a number of contenders as the Yuan Dynasty started to wind down. It all came down to, oh, about three guys who faced off to wear the mantle of dynasty founders like Qin Shi Huang, uh, Zhou Wu Wang, Liu Bang, Qin Wu Di, and Tang Gaozu. The winner was Zhu Yuanzhang, born October 21, 1328, the year of the founding of the House of Valois in France. To give you a Western point of reference, he hailed from Anhui province. Like the Han dynasty founder Liu Bang, Zhu came from nothing. Liu and Zhu were the two leaders of ancient and medieval times who came from such humble beginnings to rule China. In modern times, you had Chairman Mao and the Great One, Deng Xiaoping, two leaders who also came from a poor or semi-poor class background. Zhu was an orphan who had even taken the life of a beggar in his youth. At the age of 16, uh, his family was killed during one of the Yellow River's more serious floods. In times of famine, he lived in a Buddhist monastery and received a rudimentary education. After the monastery, where he had sought solace, was destroyed by the Mongols, he devoted himself to rebellion and overthrowing the Yuan. In 1352, he joined the White Lotus Society-inspired Red Turbans. Uh, without getting into too much detail, the Red Turbans were sort of a society or rebel group that combined aspects of Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. There he grew within the ranks of these anti-Yuan dynasty rebels to the point where he gained supremacy over the army. In 1356, his army captured Nanjing, and it was there that Zhu Yuanzhang set up his base. By 1363, he started to look like he was the front-runner to take over China, and by 1366, through the loyalty he claimed from various military commanders, he controlled all of southern China from the Three Gorges to the Yangtze Basin. He became the first person in Chinese history to ever rule the whole country from a southern rather than a northern base. The battle that really did it for Zhu Yuanzhang is significant because up to that time in 1363, this Battle of Lake Poyang, or Poyang Hu Zhejiang, was the largest naval battle the world had ever seen. It was mainly fought between Zhu Yuanzhang and his chief rival for power, the Han Emperor uh, Chen Youliang. In this battle, you had some of the same fireboats used back in the old Three Kingdoms period when Cao Cao was defeated at Red Cliff uh, by this tactic. Now, in these times of chaos, when no one was in control of any central government, you'd have these warlords sort of wrap themselves up in the name of one of the great dynasties of days gone by. So Chen Yu Liang, he was the Han Emperor based in Wuchang in present-day Hubei. And this uh, Han had nothing to do with the one of Liu Bang fame. The other main rival was Zhang Shicheng, a.k.a. Prince Cheng of the Da Zhou Dynasty. He operated out of Suzhou. As for our hero, Zhu Yuanzhang, he had fashioned himself as the Prince of Wu. So these rivals were all positioning themselves and fighting to inherit the country that the Yuan were losing due to all this Mongol internal strife and the steady drumbeat of rebellion. And they all faced off in Nanchang and ultimately at Lake Poyang from August 30 to October 4th. Poyang Lake, by the way, is China's largest freshwater lake. It's located in Jiangxi Province, uh, just northeast of the capital, Nanchang. The main battle was actually only three days, but sort of dragged on till uh, October. So Chen Youliang and then uh, Zhang Shicheng were both defeated, and with them gone, the path was clear for Zhu Yuanzhang to make his move. 
And once the word got out amidst all the tumult in society everywhere that there was now a peaceful and safe haven in Nanjing, people started flooding in. And after it became the Ming Dynasty capital, the population of Nanjing had grown something like 10 times. In January 1368, Zhu Yuanzhang established the Great Ming Dynasty. He was the second emperor since Liu Bang in 202 BC to come from such humble beginnings and later found a dynasty. Liu Bang, of course, founded the Han Dynasty, or more accurately, the Western Han. And Zhu Yuanzhang, he founds the Ming. The Ming lasted 276 years, from 1368 to 1644. Nine months after the founding of the dynasty in the south, the Yuan capital at Dadu was taken. Dadu was, of course, the name of the city that later in the Ming dynasty is renamed Beijing, or Northern Capital. However, when Zhu Yuanzhang takes the city, he renames it to Beiping. The early years of the Ming dynasty was all about cleaning house and getting rid of any leftover Yuan dynasty loyalists. And, of course, the entire infrastructure of the country was devastated from all the chaos that went on during the end of the Yuan and into the Ming. There was agriculture that needed urgent care, and the Grand Canal had fallen to disrepair. Everything that had been left more or less unattended to all these years was now finally getting addressed. Even though the dynasty officially starts in 1368, they were still bringing the outer fringes of the country into the fold. Sichuan was tamed in 1371, and the last one to be conquered and brought into the umbrella of Ming Dynasty China was the southwestern province of Yunnan, with all their steep mountains and valleys. By 1381, 82, it was all over, and China was at last not only united, but united under a Han Chinese ruler. When these Ming armies invaded Yunnan, by the way, and defeated the rebels there, a young 11-year-old Muslim boy was captured. His name was Ma He, but later on he gains fame and immortality as the eunuch Zheng He, who sailed the seas in the name of the Yongle Emperor in ships that were like the Titanics of their day. And then, you know, when it's all over, when the Ming Dynasty falls in 1644, you have yet again another foreign invader sitting on the throne in the Forbidden City. It, then it's not until Sun Yat-sen in 1912 that the Han Chinese again are the masters of their own country. So the Ming is the last Chinese dynasty where you have the Han Chinese uh, ruling. And this is also the first time that the initiative to reunify China came from the south instead of being imposed by someone from the north. So Zhu Yuanzhang rises from nothing to become founding emperor of the Ming dynasty. Starting with the Ming and also with the Qing dynasty, emperors are known in the history books by their era names. Zhu Yuanzhang's era was known as the Hongwu era, and he was therefore referred to as the Hongwu emperor. His temple name is Taizu, and if we follow the ways of the past, he would have been known in the history books more commonly as Ming Taizu. In the past, each emperor's reign would be divided up into you know little different eras, and each era would have an era name. But starting with the Ming Dynasty, there's only one single era per reign. So henceforth, until the bitter end, the emperors are known by their era names. And the first Ming emperor was the Hongwu emperor. He made a couple mistakes right from the get-go. First, he did what a lot of conquering leaders do. He kept the dysfunctional bureaucracy intact that he had inherited from his predecessor, in this case, the Yuan. Secondly, he put too much faith in his generals and didn't change the Yuan military structure either, at least not at the beginning. He reigned from 1368 to 1398, a total of 30 years Things sorted themselves out, and before long, Nanjing became a haven for men of talent escaping the chaos in the countryside and in the north. A good government was then, little by little, put together under the Hongwu Emperor once the Han were in and the Yuan remnants were all flushed out. And the Confucianists made a nice comeback during the Ming, and one of his first great successes was an agricultural reform. Huge improvements to public works related to agriculture were made that led to over-the-top achievements in production. And then this, in turn, led to a huge increase in, uh, in the population in China. 
The Great Wall was also looked after during the Ming Dynasty. Practically all that there is left of the Great Wall today, if you ever visit it, are the parts that were rebuilt and fortified during the Ming Dynasty. And even that is mostly crumbling ruins. The part of the Great Wall just north of Beijing in Badaling was restored in the 20th century and opened up to tourists in 1957. This is the part where, you know, you see the world leaders or you saw Nixon, you know, are always photographed and where all the tourists flock when they visit Beijing. While the parts of the Great Wall fortified during the Ming didn't totally stop the Mongols from invading from the north, it had the desired effect in slowing them down and limiting their incursions into China proper. This uh, emperor is best remembered for his bloody purges and his gruesome punishments. In time, he became suspicious of everyone around him, was, and it was extremely averse to hearing any kind of criticism whatsoever. In fact, there's an old story amidst the worst of the emperor's purges. Uh, some upright official or Confucian scholar petitioned the emperor in person to speak out against his excesses, and he brought a coffin with him, and after he had spoken his piece to the emperor, he climbed into the coffin and prepared himself for the emperor's wrath. And the story goes that the Hongwu Emperor, respecting this man's sincerity and bravery to dare speak out, pardoned him and considered his advice. But this first Ming Emperor, he was suspicious and paranoid of rebellions, of secret societies, and later on even the military where he himself had come from. No one was safe from these frequent political purges. The Great Purge of 1380, where he did away with his Prime Minister, Wu Weiyang, led to the deaths of up to 40,000 people who he suspected as enemies or conspirators or even remotely connected to the conspirators. And he went after not only his enemies, but their families as well, and anyone who ever had the misfortune to be connected to the disgraced prime minister. And as a side note, after this incident, when he suspected his prime minister was conspiring against him, he did away with the entire palace administration and henceforth handled day-to-day -day affairs himself. The prime ministership, chancellery, everything, both done away with. So if you imagine, like, uh, President Obama in the White House, just doing away with his whole White House staff, you know, making all his photocopies by himself, answering every email, answering the phones, talking to the press, dealing with the Congress and foreign relations. I mean, that's what happened. And, of course, this turned out to be the biggest bottleneck in Chinese history, and things started to fall apart with regard to the administration. As for his handling of the provinces, the Hongwu Emperor's way to deal with uh, keeping tabs on all parts of China was to fill these positions of power in these principalities with his sons. And theoretically, he need not fear any rebellion then, with his own flesh and blood watching his back out in the provinces. And his patriot of Buddhism also ceased around this time, and they once again fell out of favor. Rather than look at Buddhism as part of the state structure, which is what they had become, they were viewed upon with deep suspicion. So ever since the first Buddhist temple was built in China in 68 AD, the Buddhists, they rode this roller coaster, sometimes up, sometimes down, depending on the emperor at the time. So after a good 30-year run as the founding emperor of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, Ming Taizu, the, the Hongwu Emperor, he died in 1398. It was he who restored Chinese rule to China after almost a century of rule by the Mongols. It was indeed the end of an era, but a new era was about to begin. We're going to stop here with the death of the Hongwu Emperor in 1398 and pick up next week when Zhu Di outflanks the Jianwen Emperor and usurps the throne, setting himself up as the third Ming Emperor. And we'll look at him next time. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, brief talk on Ming China. We are going to continue next time talking about the next major emperor, Zhu Di. And with that, 